Good evening, everyone. Thanks for having me. Hopefully you can understand me through my ridiculously overly exaggerated um, fixed Scottish accent. Um, but yeah, so um, really the sort of purpose of me coming along today is to kind of like cover kind of high level so there shouldn't be any code, I don't think. So um, it's not like a hands-on or anything, so just kind of relax. But it'll be kind of three high level topics um, which hopefully should stitch together into a kind of a story. And hopefully at the end you'll kind of see where I'm going with that. Um, so the, the first part is really, I just want to cover off this idea of like dynamic banking or dynamic finance. So kind of what that means. Um, so I've uh, had experience kind of working in that area around the world. So what, what, what does that actually mean? What sort of new innovations are coming out from that? So it's going to be a very subjective, like what I have seen and why it's pretty cool. And then um, I'll then talk into, this is the controversial part, or this is actually the probably more controversial than the main part, but why I think AI and DevOps is pretty much a marriage um, in perfection and is probably, I think, in the next five years, people moving into those career, um, the interface between those two will make a lot of money and will make a lot of success and will, will change a lot of companies for the better. And then finally, I'll talk a little bit about this idea of a, well, we, we say one size fits all in the sense that you can kind of fit your hand in a bin bag. It's a kind of like a catch all, but the idea of a, a, um, a roadmap, initially it was a five year roadmap that I had. Uh, uh, so when I was in China, um, some of the big banks there that are just going through open banking. And so we got together with the fin think tanks and, and thought about a five year roadmap to um, rolling out uh, fully automated and scalable AI products. So that's kind of the angle that I'm coming from. Okay, I'll just a, a quick introduction and then I'll, I'll, I'll jump on. So I'm the uh, head of DevOps at Barclays in the security area, so that's the CSO. So everything from working on um, rolling out um, secure, scalable apps to keep the bank safe, as well as keep the branches safe as well. Um, I've got a background working with all the big banks in the UK and across the other countries as well. So I've worked in America, China, India, Europe, um, and here in Scotland. Um, that's still Britain for now, anyway. Um, that's not a political point. I was just, but uh, uh, yeah. And then, and then, so the angle that I kind of come in at is, is probably like most of you here. As I've been at all parts of the software development life cycle. So I started off with like mainframe uh, devs who are close to retirement now and then went into um, uh, testing environment, sysadmin, so kind of been at all parts and um, I've kind of seen it all and what works and what definitely, definitely, definitely doesn't work. Um, and then finally, I've, I've kind of, uh, a, bit, a bit of a linguist, so I speak seven languages, five languages fluently, which kind of got me into the tech um, and the other countries to see what other people are doing. It's mostly the same. Um, in summary. And then um, finally, uh, my academic career has been heavily focused on AI, uh, physics and um, neurocomputing, which is kind of like the old school AI. Okay, I'll open with this bombshell. Um, from what I can see anyway, unless they're keeping their GitHubs, um, somebody can tell me, unless it's all private repos. Um, but yeah, the point I would kind of open and stress, stress with is, so I've worked with data scientists and I've worked with DevOps engineers in the UK, the States, and China. And the problem is everywhere I go, it's the same. They don't get on very well. So like DevOps engineers and, and AI data scientists, data engineers just don't get on well. Part of the reason is, is because we're both new. So 10 years for, for DevOps and probably about seven years for AI and, 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 and big software companies for like big finance, FinTech and things. We came in and we were the love child and we got brought into the software development life cycle, developers like us, operations like us, testers like us, but then data scientists came in and they actually offer a really, really interesting dynamic, but nobody understands them. So clearly there's a problem there. And so I'll kind of touch on that a little bit more as we go through, but I kind of think like this touching point is so, so important because in, in a sense, we're all here for the DevOps, right? And, and DevOps spans more than one discipline. So if anybody's likely to bring them into the fold, it's us. And so the work is to be done on our side, additionally their side. 
Um, if you just look at data scientists and real developers or testers talk to each other, and the, the confusion, it's, it's, it spans languages and borders. So it's something that we need to work on to kind of bring, bring together, and I think it's a, a great potential. So I did this on PowerPoint like last year and then put it on LinkedIn and it got like over a thousand likes. I'm not quite sure why. I just took a few stars with like no background. But I just wanted to show like this is, for me, this is by no means a comprehensive exhaustive list. But you'll all know, like everybody here will know some of them. And likely you probably realize that the reason I separated them into constellations is there's, there's a little bit of a, a connection. The AI put at the bottom is more of just the DevOps side, which I'm seeing. Um, you can add PySpark to that now. But generally, if you then add AI on top of that, it doubles. Um, so I kind of the point I'm kind of getting across at is we're in the two disciplines where you have to have quite a lot of experience. So when, when DevOps came out 10 years ago, it was mostly sysadmins. Um, but now people have developed this, these great skills with these great tools, um, and it's just going to keep continue moving forward. Um, okay, okay, fine. I'm going to change gears a little bit now. Um, I'm timing myself, so I'll make sure there's a lot of content. I might be talking at 100 miles per hour, so I apologize in advance. Okay, so um, how can I wing this? Probably, like, I'll say what I think is the most useful thing f for you guys. Um, when I was in China and I got to work, I worked with Tencent in the Construction Bank of China. Construction Bank of China is just like the banks here. They're super slow. They just they do it in Java and they don't do it in COBOL. That's about the difference. But the, the speed at which FinTech is moving there is, is on a par with here. The difference is, is the access to resources that they have is much better and the services that they roll out are better. They're, they're, they're better tested. So I'm going to give you an example of two services that I've seen which are amazing. Um, there's a thing called smart contracts in China, I'm translating, but it's essentially, imagine you're like a tenant and the landlord, and you sit down and you talk with your landlord, and you put the smart contracts phone in front of you, and, and you say, um, as you talk about the lease that you're going to have, it underwrites the lease in real time, and you might say, oh, well, can I have a dog? And the, the landlord might say, hmm, yes. In real time, there's a number above his head and there's a number above your head, which is, I can't quite translate it, but it's something like integrity index, which is just basically a lie detector. So it, it, it's mapping your audio and facial recognition in real time. Obviously, that's running on the cloud, so there's a bit of a lag, but it is fantastic. And so at the end, once you finish, that's all underrated and you get it for free. Where they make money is, at the end, they say, oh, we'll, we'll actually underwrite that insurance for you. We, we produce the tenancy agreement for you for free. Would you like us to underwrite that for you? That's how far ahead they are with us, than us. Uh, another example is, um, which has got 50 million users now, um, and I met the CEO of the, of the product, is this thing, I, I don't know the name of the product, but if you're, like, for example, if you have a car crash, what you can do is you take your phone out, you switch the camera on, and it'll say, come closer, Go under the wheel trim, stand back, go to the right, and it maps the damages that's done in your car and produces a price. And then they, what happens is, the idea is, is you can go to the mechanic, and if he says, oh, that's a thousand pounds, you say, well, actually, it's 500 here. Where they make the money is like an Uber service. So they, they have mechanics approved uh, WeChat. It's, all, it's in WeChat, approved WeChat mechanics who will pick that order up for you. So you have a list and they'll all take it so you can, just, you can do it in real time. So that's how far ahead they are. Um, some other areas um, which are quite interesting, so um, I worked on a, a dynamic banking app, IPB, about seven years ago for Lloyds. Um, not boasting, but I won the hackathon for it. Um, but we, it was essentially, it was like really basic and it was like it interfaced with Facebook and Skype. And at the time, for a big bank, that was like, wow! And you could say to it like, um, when, 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 when does the bank close? Where's the nearest bank to me? So it's all very static, simple things, and it was fine. And the leaders in that now in the UK are HSBC, where they build intelligence and have the authentication in the background, so you can say things like, um, how much have I got left um, till the end of the month? When is my rent due? Build me a spending profile. Um, you know, 
where, what are my next bills um, or where am I potentially going to run out of money? So that's there now um, and some of the things they're doing is pretty impressive. Other things include things like biobanking, so like um, retina authenticated transactions. In the States, um, particularly on the, the East Coast, not the West Coast, you can get authenticated for a bank account with your LinkedIn. Um, as long as you have more than five years of a LinkedIn activity, the, th the, the, the rationale being it's much harder to fake five years of LinkedIn activity than it is to fake a driver's license. So you can be accepted for, not for a loan just yet, but you can be accepted for, for a bank account in, in many banks in America. So these things obviously require high scalability and a bit of intelligence behind it. Um, but this, for me, I think is part of the second wave of, of AI automation. So it's the idea of like, it's like intelligently assisted services, so it, it doesn't make the decision for you. In China and America, they're now looking at the more the intelligently driven services, and in London as well. That's the next wave. So if you're thinking of anything lower than that, it's highly unlikely you're going to make success um, in your business model. Okay, so does anybody know why it's smile to pay? I just want to see if anybody... I, I ask audiences wherever I go, and sometimes people get it. Do you have any idea why you smile to pay? Um, Yeah, that, close, close. The, yeah, so, so there's two parts. The part, part that you said, it's like a flag, right? So um, most of our faces is, is like our face at rest, which looks pretty miserable, especially if you're in Scotland. But um, yeah, so, but, but, so, so essentially all the facial recognition done at the moment is just your standard face. So in China and Alibaba, what they thought was, if we get people to smile to pay, we get two things. First, we get the change, which is like a flag. So to process that and parse that is, is, quite, is a lot easier because the frequency that it occurs is lower, so it's more predictable. And the second is it generates niche data. So in today's world, regardless if you accept it or not, you're, at some point you're gonna have to learn AI just like everybody has to learn the internet. It will get easier, but we're going there. And AI at the moment, clearly the currency is data. So what they do is they then generate this new niche data that never existed before, and then they then slice it and dice it and sell it to other companies, and they generate, they generate revenue from nothing, essentially, from a smile. Um, so that's, that's what they've done. Okay, I'll, I'll kind of, I will shift on a bit quicker, but this is kind of the last point, which hopefully can, I, I kind of want to stress upon you how much there can still be gained. So at the moment, when you phone up the bank, when you phone up the, your electric and gas, of that data that they, they process and they use, even for marketing, is about 20%. Because it's, it's colleague engagement forms, it's feedback surveys, it's things that tick boxes that can be parsed quite easily by regex. It's not free format speech, like the way you talk. That's really hard. We're just at the cusp now where we can begin to do pretty interesting things with sentiment analysis, and um, the big one is text summarization. But that's where we are now, like, like right now. If you're working on that now, that is fantastic. But the point I want to get at is there's still 80% of the business to be captured. You just need some smart ideas. Um, okay, um, uh, before I kind of move on to the more techie bit, um, so again, I worked with WeChat, um, or Tencent. I also did an almost identical thing in Lloyd's, um, and the difference was stunning. Uh, no, no fault to Lloyd's, but when you work with somebody like Apple Pay, so if you, if, you tap your, if you tap your card for Apple Pay, then it's my code that's put in for the payment. That was very, 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 very hard because when you work for big banks and big companies, you do what the vendor says if they're very big. So, so there's no wiggle room. What Apple say goes. And if, you don't, if you're not in the club, you're not in the club. So there's no flexibility. Whereas in China, it was slightly different. Um, they knew open banking was going to be a big thing here. So the governments gave um, mandated and paired up companies. So rather than um, rather than it just let the free market dictate, they said, why don't you two work together 
And that's what happened with WeChat, which they then invented, which pr probably everybody's <coughs> aware of um, WeChat Pay, which is now, it now accounts for 80% of all transactions in China. So it's way overtaking cash. Um, so yeah. Okay, so um, of all the companies out there, um, it's looking like, I won't stay on this too much, but it's looking like about 25% are saying that they have no interest in doing AI. So this was a survey of 2,000 companies in 2017. Roughly about 500 said they have no interest. The rest said it's on the roadmap, or it's on the roadmap to be on the roadmap, if, if that makes sense. Um, anyway, yeah, of course, um, to the gentleman earlier, I think that's an opportunity for FinTech. It's a space to move into. Okay, shifting gears a bit more. Um, it's just fancy pictures, don't worry about it if you don't know much about AI. But all I'm trying to be is clear on the definition. When I talk about AI, I do not mean automation. I'll cover a bit more on automation later. They're very different, but they're used interchangeably, especially, um, especially in big monolithic companies. Um, when I say AI, I, kind of, I have a broad umbrella. So everything from machine learning to deep, um, yeah, to deep neural, neural network learning or GANs, reinforcement learning, um, feed forward, the whole lot. Again, now we, take, we go to our checkpoint. Why DevOps for AI? I talk a lot about AI. Why DevOps for AI? Again, all of these companies that I have seen succeed, every single one of them have a very, very mature DevOps um, um, uh, platform or process that they've been working on over two or three years. I went to one company I can't name in China who are huge, and one of their DevOps engineers just said, oh yeah, well, here's the PPT, there's our entire, um, here's our entire architectural diagram, our entire architectural breakdown. It was very, very mature, like a lot of diagrams here, like a lot of the things that I'm seeing here. It can totally be done. I agree with the gentleman earlier. If you're new, you want to start and do things, microservices, you want to work that way, you want to do infrastructure as code. It doesn't mean if you're big or if you haven't got the plan yet that you can't do it. There's always a way to get to where you need to go. But yeah, um, and this is another theme that I'll be rolling out. Automation ultimately is, for me, is spearheaded by DevOps, particularly around the tooling that we use. If you do not automate first, what you will have is you'll have a situation where you'll have something that could potentially be, if your automation is not mature, you could potentially be rolling out a very, very intelligent defect rapidly. <laughs> so there's a bit of a pro order there, which is why I go to the, the roadmap. Okay, for people a bit more techy, um, I try to keep this as broad as I can and, and spark, pique everybody's interest. So some starters for 10, what would be pretty cool? So I've talked about products, but what about the feedback loop? Like what can AI do for DevOps? One thing I saw was, uh, I saw um, a techie in a small company said they'd done, they'd done deployments for two years and uh, Dynatrace and AppDynamics and um, Splunk had all their uh, executives had been calling them up to try and treat them to dinner because they had two years of logs and they didn't know what to do with them, and they had a bit of money to spend. But rather than spending the money, what they did was they just processed the two years of logs with three lines of, um, of uh, uh, feed-forward neural network codes, and they were able to predict when things were going wrong. And the, the point here in DevOps is, when it goes wrong, it's generally counterintuitive. Right? So, and I think most people agree. Sometimes it's obvious, sometimes it's, a, you know, it's um, an variable not initialized, or a feed didn't come in. A lot of the time, you end up digging, and when you finally find the issue, you generally feel quite stupid because it's something that you maybe didn't consider. So there's, there are some really quick wins that can be done, which requires minimal skill and talent to implement. Um, one that I like quite recently is um, generating YAML and Docker files from, from machine learning. So essentially, I want to do this. Create me an automation pipeline. Um, so I guess automation pipeline as a service um, intelligently or something like that. Um, okay, um, I'll skip that part. I'll move on to the roadmap now. Um, got about 10 minutes, so hopefully this should be enough. Um, I kind of think 
again, working quite closely with business, it, there's a people element here, and it's overly stated, or sorry, it's, it's not stated enough. There needs to be people processes, pro, people processes and tools working together, and those developments need to all happen at the same time in order for it to be a success. And I'll, I'll just, we'll just walk through it. I think it's easier if I just walk through it. Okay, so you start, imagine it's 2019, so you, your CEO or the guy at the top needs to have, he needs to be, or he or she needs to be bought into the vision. They need to create their vision statement and it, do, and it cannot be wishy-washy. It has to be concise and it has to give some indicators to what you're actually investing in. So that usually means that that person has to speak to people below him or her to understand what the landscape actually looks like. I, I say spend six months to a year scoping. Business as usual will still carry on. It's not stop. Just take your time, work through it. Digitization is something that is, again, in the UK and the USA, is, it seems this digital transformation, we don't seem to understand what it actually means. In my case, or for the case if you want to roll out superior products, it means have nothing on paper. If you've, st if you've still got a core element of your business that is on paper or that's not being stored in databases, then you've not completed your digital transformation. It's as simple as that. But you'd be surprised how many businesses have not completed their, their digital transformation. Um, it just needs to be said. Then I think time needs to be spent. You don't want to be chasing your tails. Again, this is just, a, I guess this is, I, I apologize if this is condescending. And I'm just maybe in a bit of an echo chamber here, but I think we all kind of need to hear this, including myself, again and again. Um, do a little bit of investment up front. Sure, don't do it all. But if you, if you work under a support model, which is learn it on the job, you'll be chasing your tail. And then when you start to scale and work with more and more complex processes, then it will be, it'll be increasingly harder for you to, to change and, and, and go back to a positive direction when things go wrong. Okay, so again, it's not wait two years and start automating. If it was a five-year journey, you can compress it, but generally roughly about, say, 25% in. If you haven't automated at that point, I think that's a big, um, th those are warning, warning flags. Then you need to think about things like um, data lake and not data swamp. So when you bring in data scientists, um, they will say things like, oh, I could just access all the customer data and then link that to um, spending profile or something like that. They don't, like, I'm not criticizing, but there has to be an understanding of not just what databases can talk to others, but compliance. So there's a compliance side of things. One of the biggest blockers, and, and this is even for developers, is understanding what you can actually read and what you can't, and what you can control and what you can't. So you want to get your data plan in it clean and ready, probably about two or three years in, no later, and, and decide how that is going to look like, not just an architectural diagram. Okay, um, I, do think, I do think moving to cloud or containerization is the correct move. I can't. There's one company I, I, I work with their head DevOps um, for Walmart in America. They're the only company that, company that I know have not moved to cloud. Everything that they run is on bare metal. It, it, very, very high computation. They paid for all the servers themselves. That's because they're one of the biggest companies in America and they can afford to do that. And they are banking on if they buy servers for five years, the chances are that cloud technologies are going to improve significantly in five years is low compared to the gains that they will have from owning their own tech stack. Most banks and most big companies have already given up on that argument and are already moving to cloud or main parts to cloud. I think it's the, the right choice. If you have lots and lots and lots of money, you can consider the alternative. Of, of course, secu you know, if any, I, I work in security, so I have to say this. Security comes every day, every minute, every second. However, the security, <laughs> security of your AI and your, and your automation, when you mix them together, is going to be a very, very potent um, uh, uh, force that we will not understand. 
there is no solution for this right now, globally. And I talk to the players. It's, there are lots of, okay, step back. Last month, Tesla released, probably people might be aware that they've released fleet, fleet computing. So they're the, the first to actually put their models in the hands of the customers, but they've encrypted it. So in theory, if you can decrypt the model on a Tesla car, you have the complete um, business blueprint for Tesla. You have all of their secrets and their entire model, if you can decrypt it. I'm not saying you can, but it shows that the thinking around security, even in the biggest companies, is still not mature. And that's why it kind of needs to have, like, at this point, you need to have that crisp. Um, the other security carries on as BAU. Then you think about the ramp, okay? So you've done all the work. I, I, and my story is much like the gentleman earlier. It's, it's, it's building blocks. It's a very similar story. Before you move and transition to intelligent services, you begin to put the ramp down and you, you, you fine tune. But the point I want to drive is AI comes at the end, not at the beginning. Um, if you do it any earlier, again, the same idea. Intelligent services used in the wrong way can make things drastically worse, particularly around um, customer data and security. So it comes at the end of the journey. And I do appreciate a lot of this as common sense, but it's quite nice just to see things, how it flows. And then finally, my point of view, which I've seen in WeChat and Alibaba, and then, um, um, so I, I worked with NASA for a short period and they did that as well. As soon as they have something new, they reward their employees with it, not customers. So they test it out on their employees. They let their employees try what they've built. I think that's pretty cool. I think that's a recipe for success. I think if you've got something new and, and you begin to build your AI services, do it if it's things like you know, um, improving salary, um, like pension benefits, or helping customers better identify what their, their, you know, their, their end of year benefit selection is and things like that. Um, you know, repay, repay the people who spent five years with you to make it happen. Um, it does sound like I've talked a lot about AI. Um, obviously, I have to stress that doing AI for the sake of AI is meaningless and just wastes money. But I think a lot of people here will remember in 1995, 1997, 1988, 9, most people thought internet would not take off in the sense that it did. I mean, Elon Musk, I think, has said that he approached um, uh, Yellow Pages, who said to him, they'll never, ever, ever go online. And now you can see the yellow pages reducing in size and size and size. And with all companies have gone online. The same will happen with AI. It won't be in a way that you won't be able to understand it. I think it will be very much in a way that everybody put Microsoft Office on their CV in the early 2000s. We all have to do it at some level. We have to engage with it you know, at some level. So I, I think it's going to happen. I'm not saying everybody go and start doing YouTube courses or Udemy courses and start learning, but try and think how that fits into your company's business model and particularly how you can uplift that with um, DevOps. Okay, I'm not going to drivel on. I think I'll end there uh, two minutes early. And um, yeah, um, thank you everyone for uh, taking time to listen to me.